until I hit the button. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Marcia Watson. I'm president of the Patuxent Bird Club. And our guest speaker tonight is Jim Brighton, one of two co-founders of the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Jim is a Maryland native and more specifically an Eastern Shore native. He, in his profession, is following in a family tradition in the boat building trade. His grandfather, Jim Richardson, was a boat builder, and Jim works for Campbell's Boatyard in Oxford. In his spare time, he and Bill Hubick run the Maryland Biodiversity Project, and it's been 10 years now. Is that right, Jim? Yeah, yeah, yeah 10, uh, 11 years almost. Yeah, 11. Yeah, the, the, 11. They just had their 10th anniversary last fall. So um, the Maryland Biodiversity Project, if you haven't heard of it before, is an astounding undertaking. It's a very ambitious undertaking to catalog and map every living thing in Maryland. And I, I have to say that the success of the project is really due to Jim and Bill's um, not only undying enthusiasm, but also love for all the things that are out there, the plants and the animals and, you know, everything that flies and swims and croaks and whatnot. So we really have this them personally um, and, and their uh, skills to thank for having this project here in the state of Maryland. I don't know if there's anything like it elsewhere. I think it's pretty unique. So um, as I said, they've been going for 10 years now. They have amassed a really formidable um, baseline of records and reports from across the state of all forms of living things. And Jim is gonna tell us about how Maryland Biodiversity Project works. And he's gonna also talk about some of their more recent targeted endeavors. And I, I just wanted to mention that they've been getting a lot of kudos for their project, not the least of which is they were named Conservationist of the Year by the Maryland Wildlife Advisory Commission, which is a governor appointed commission that advises the Department of Natural Resources. So take it away, Jim. Okay, uh, so I want everybody to know that this is only my second time doing this. <laughs> so uh, on Zoom. So uh, if if I stumble a little bit, please forgive me. So I'm going to do. This. Can uh, let's see here. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Can you see that? Am I, is, not, is this? Not slide? yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. You might have to double click on that. Let's see. And meanwhile, I'm muting everybody and turning off everybody's cameras to save bandwidth. Gotcha. gotcha. So, um, Marsha, what I'm not seeing is sharing my screen. Uh, down at the bottom, you should have a row of icons and a, there should be a green button in the middle, share screen. Let's see. Okay, got it, share screen. And I'm gonna do this one. There you go. We're seeing what you're seeing. How's that? We That's got good. it? Yep, we, I've got a lady slipper on the screen. Awesome. Okay, guys, so let's get this going. So, uh, Thank you, Marsha, for inviting me to present to you guys. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is basically the information that you can glean from the Maryland Biodiversity Project website. Um, we'll talk about all the different uh, ways that you can explore uh, the website, and we're going to talk about how you can use iNaturalist to actually help populate the MVP database. And we're also going to talk about uh, some of the neat stuff that MVP does around the state, like our um, Turkey Point uh, morning flight count and the Dan's Rock morning flight count. So to begin, uh, imagine you're walking through the woods. Uh, you've just moved here from um, Germany, and you see this wonderful, beautiful flower, right? You're pretty sure you've seen something like this before. You're pretty sure it's an orchid. Imagine if there was a website where you could go, where you could not just, you could get a list of all the orchids that are found in the state. And not just that, 
but you can get county bar charts for all the distribu county distributions for all the species of orchids. And not just that, but you get photos of all the orchid species that are found in the state. This is the Maryland Biodiversity Project in a nutshell. This plant's pretty famous, especially for me and Bill. Uh, this is a world loose strife. Uh, at the time this picture was taken, I didn't realize what the plant was. And we can say that this is the plant that actually started the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Um, Bill and I were walking uh, in Severn Run Natural Area in Anne Arundel County. And I took a picture of this plant. And when I got home, I tried to identify it. I didn't know what it was. And I pulled out one of my books and realized that there was a few species that looked the same. And I got frustrated because I couldn't figure out what plants were found in our state. Uh, I didn't have brown and brown. Um, the USDA uh, US Plant Atlas didn't have any data for Maryland, which was uh, very um, kind of upset me that we were one of the two states that didn't have any data at the time. So I was complaining to Bill about this a few days later, and we decided that uh, we were going to develop a website that would give people lists as complete as possible of all the living things in the state. And here we are 11 years later. Um, when you Google uh, the Maryland Biodiversity Project, this is what you get. You get the, this is our homepage. And there's a ton of information on this page. Um, up here, you'll, uh, you see right here, it's, uh, it's our, um, Mission statement, the Maryland Biodiversity Project is a 501c3 nonprofit organization focused on cataloging the living things of Maryland. We promote conservation, science, and education by helping to build a vibrant nature study community. Underneath that, we have uh, a link to our blog and our daily social posts. We're going to talk more about that later. Underneath that, we have announcements. So whenever a new species is added to the website or something really neat uh, is found in the state, we make an announcement here. So if we clicked on the new aphid species that was added to MVP by Matt Bizet, um, this would take you to that species page. Underneath that, we have uh, our numbers. So I made this uh, presentation last week, so it's the numbers are totally changed. But as of right now, there's over 20,700 uh, species in checklists. We have of those species, 13 over 13,000 have photographs. We have over 739,000 total photos on the website, and over 884,000 total records. Um, if you come back, if you looked at the website right now, all four of those numbers would be higher. And if you come back the next, within an hour, the numbers will change. That's how often we're adding stuff to the database. It's almost constant. Underneath that, we have a list of all the recent uh, photos. Like, like the numbers, these change constantly. So every time you would refresh, your uh, uh, screen, uh, new new photographs would be on, uh, would be listed. And you can click these and it would take you right to the species page. Over here, we have a, uh, if you had, I don't know, four or five years to just sit and look at your computer, you would uh, slowly get to see all the photos on the website. It's a rotating um, slideshow of photos. Um, and up here in the top right corner is a search bar. Um, you can search by common name, uh, scientific name, synonym, you know, it, you can search by anything. It will take you straight to the species page. Now, up here we have pull down menus. So vertebrates, you can see all the, you, it would take you to a list of all the vertebrates, all the amphibians, the birds, the fishes. Let's uh, let's click on birds, and it will take you to a list of all 
I'm not sure how many birds there are four, 460 some birds now uh, that I've been seeing in the state. Uh, and here's a full list of all 460 species. Um, up here, uh, you can see, whoops, you can see that there's icons and I'm actually having difficulty seeing those. But the first one I believe is a camera icon. If you click that, it will take you to all the bird photos on the website. So you could slowly go through and just stare at all the bird photos, which is really awesome. The next icon was a globe, uh, and that will take you to county bar charts. So you can see every bird species and see what counties those birds have been seen in. If it's dark green, that means we have a record from that county. The next icon gives you a heat map, and we'll get more into heat maps uh, down uh, later on in the presentation. But basically, this is a quad map. Uh, the darker the red, the more species have been seen in that quad. So you can see, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but you can see like, uh, you know, uh, Ocean City and Assateg are pretty bright red. Um, Bill lived here, I think, in Sparrows Point, which is really high. Uh, I think that's the highest one. It has 291 species. But uh, we'll, more on that later. And the next icon is a slideshow where you can just sit if you're uh, um, and slowly uh, at full screen photos of all the birds on the website. So if you typed in brown headed nuthatch into your search bar, this is what you'd get. All of our uh, species pages look the same, have the same layout. Basically, you have the name, the scientific name, and the authorship and the year that the uh, organism uh, was authored. Next to that, you have a camera icon. If you click the camera icon, once again, you'll get photos of all the species uh, or all the photos we have of that species. So for brown-headed nuthatch, you would get 30 or I, I don't even know how many, 100 photos of brown-headed nuthatch. Um, Underneath that, we have uh, uh, a basic taxonomic uh, layout, starting from kingdom down to genus. Uh, if we have recognized subspecies or varieties, uh, we, we often lift, list those as well. Uh, underneath that, we have a county bar chart. And like... Uh, in the bird list with the, with the county charts. If it's dark green, that means we have a record of that species for that county. Um, some people didn't like the county bar chart, so we created a map, <laughs> which basically does the same thing. Uh, if it's dark green, um, that means we have a record. So you can see that, you know, uh, brown headed nut hatches are basically tied to the coastal plain, right? You'll see here the view quad details. If you click that, it will take you to a, uh, a quad map for that species. So this gives you an even better idea of uh, distribution in the state. Uh, the darker the purple, the more records we have for that species in that quad. So right here, uh, this is Blackwater. People go to Blackwater to see uh, brown-headed nuthatches, right? So uh, this, this is a, a good representation. This is northern, uh, or yeah, this is Assateague. So another really easy place, Point Lookout, another easy place to go and see brown-headed nuthatches, right? So this gives you a basic layout. Now, not all records are mapped to quad. So uh, if you see, say we had uh, um, a record from Nanjamoy, but we weren't able to map that record to a quad, it wouldn't show up on the quad map. So underneath the, the county maps, uh, we have these status description where to find in relationship fields. But we're slowly starting to get these filled out 
uh, for most of our more common species, most of the vertebrates and a lot of the butterflies and uh, dragonflies and damselflies, but we still are, it, we have 20,000 species to fill out. So it's taking us a while, but basically uh, what, what this uh, shows us is for the status is, it, uh, it tells us how common the uh, species is in the state and kind of uh, give, just gives you an all round uh, synopsis of that species. So for brown headed nuthatch, it says common on the Eastern shore and Loblolly pine stands and common in pine stands on Point Lookout St. Mary's uh, appears to be expanding its range to inland Loblolly pine communities. For the description, we give a really basic, uh, you know, Maryland smallest nuthatch, the brown cap, gray back, and white belly are diagnostic among our three nuthatch species. Where to find gives you basically, we try to give just a basic idea for uh, many species on where you can go to see them. Um, you know, like it says, if you want to see brown headed nut hatches, uh, find loblolly pines on the coastal plain. Uh, the relationships underneath that is, is one of our coolest. Uh, fields. So this is where you get for like a butterfly, you would get hope we would put host plant uh, data. So basically, a loblolly pine is you could say is a host plant for brown headed nuthatch. They're inseparable. Um, so it says very closely affiliated with loblolly pine, you can click loblolly pine. And nothing's working. and it will take you to the Loblolly Pine page. So you can flip back and forth. And as you can see, the Loblolly Pine page uh, looks just like the brown-headed nuthatch. So you can see that um, basically coastal plain and fall line, and it gives you more status. Uh, uh, under the relationships, it says many species such as brown-headed nuthatch are dependent. Uh, yellow-throated warblers on the coastal plain. Um, so you could click brown-headed nuthatch and you go back to the brown-headed nuthatch page. So underneath the status, we have uh, new seasonality charts, which is really cool. Uh, brown-headed nuthatch isn't necessarily one of the best ones to see how the seasonality charts work um, because these birds are resident. Um, but for like flowering plants and stuff, you, you get nice, uh, mountain-esque bar charts. Uh, um, so we, we have these for all of, our, all of our species. Underneath the seasonality charts, uh, for many bird species, we're starting to add sound. So you can click on this and actually hear what the birds sound like. Uh, and we're doing this for um, many different species like grasshoppers and cicadas and crickets and things like that. So all kinds, we're, we're slowly starting to get those uh, fleshed out as well for many of the species that make sounds. So uh, here we have a chestnut side warbler. This is one of my favorite bird species that are found in the state. So for all of our species pages, uh, <laughs> underneath the status and field quads, which are relationship stuff and uh, uh, seasonality charts. Um, oops, we have links that you can go to. So for all bird species, you can go and see the chestnut sided warbler uh, distribution map, right? So you can see down here that's a heavy wintering area. And then most notably, it breeds up here in the boreal forests and along the Appalachians. We also have, uh, you can click a link that will take you to the iNaturalist page, right? Where you get uh, all even more different types of information. Also, and I think this is really cool, it takes you to the NatureServe page where you can get an idea of, of if the species is trapped, where it's being tracked in certain states. So uh, you can see here on if, if, uh, if you're in if the if your state's in blue, um, 
it's a secure species, right? But if it's in red or dark orange, it's critically imperiled, right? So Arizona must have very, very small breeding populations, as does Arkansas and South Dakota. And finally, for all species, you can get a you can click the Google image link and it will take you and show you all different types of all the Google image photos. So you can get a real good idea of uh, of what a species looks like. For moths and insects, we also have links to bug guide. Um, so you can go and click, uh, go to bug guidance, get all the information that you need for a Luna moth. And for all the moths, you can get a link that takes you to the moth photographers group. And this is, if you like moths, this is a, this is the website to go to. You can get almost, you know, pretty good point data and get an idea of moth distribution for thousands of species found in North America. So you can see that Luna moths are pretty much, pretty much relegated just to the Eastern North America. Some, some, uh, you know, basically to the Great Plains. For plants, we even have more links. Uh, you can go to the Maryland Plant Atlas, which gives you uh, a more detailed, um, uh, all different types of ways to view data in the state even more for plants. Um, you can go uh, click the link for the floor of North America and it'll take you to the floor of North America page. And it will take you to the Mid-Atlantic Herbaria Consortium where you can actually look at specimens of that plant from all different types of herbaria across the country. And we have a link to our own Norton Brown herbarium species uh, uh, um, specimens that you can see. For orchids, we also have a link to the Smithsonian Go Orchid site. Um, if you like orchids, highly recommend you checking out this, these pages. It just gives you a wealth of information for all of our orchid species. So kudzu, uh, one of the banes of, of, of horribleness in the state. Um, as you can see up here, we have tags. It says non-native invasive. All of our tags uh, are, are, you can click on the tag and you can get a complete list of all the non-native species in the database, right? If a species is non-native, most likely we have a non-native tag. If you don't see a non-native tag, you can pretty much rest assured that that species is native to Maryland. So you could click the non-native tag and it would give you a list of all the non-native uh, species in the state, right? You could click the invasive tag and you could get a list of all the invasive species in the state. Um, uh, it's a pretty cool way to, to get a good idea of, of, um, of what's invasive and non-native. So on the homepage, uh, under the Explore tab, if you're wondering what quad you're in, you can go to the Maryland Quad Map, hit that, and it will give you a link uh, that shows uh, Maryland Quad Map. And you can click on each quad and get a name. So if you were at Jug Bay, you could click and you were in the Bristol Quad. It's a easy, really easy way to find out what quad you're in. Underneath that, we have the Maryland Quad Heat Map. Uh, if you click that, you'll get a heat map of all the all the all of our data, basically. Um, if you look, uh, most you know, the more red uh, 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 quad is, the more species we have from that quad. Does that mean that the Baltimore Washington corridor has the most species of anywhere in the state? No right? This is just where we have the most records of things because more people live here. Uh, 
this is like Finzel Swamp and 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 Green Ridge and uh, a lot of uh, like uh, Potomac State Forest and Tyler Bell lives down here in St. Mary's. Uh, um, this is where I live. Uh, so I, there's a lot of data. This, um, um, I think this is the Myersville quad. This is where Mark Etheridge lives and he's one of our uh, moth uh, experts and he's been collecting moth data from his house. So uh, this is a big, you know, a lot of species from there. So it doesn't really, the heat map doesn't really show you where the most species are is just where we have the most records of species. So you can see up here, uh, the most uh, reported biodiversity is 4,436 species from the Laurel Quad, and that's Patuxent North Track, point blank. More work has been done at Patuxent North Track than almost anywhere in the state. So, and it shows on our, on our, on our heat map. If you click on the Bristol quad, you can see, uh, you can click on any quad and you can see how many species we have for that quad. So for the Bristol quad, which is where Drug Bay is, we have 1,887 species. You can click on the view quad list and you can get a list of all the species found in the Bristol quad. You can also click on the top 100 observers for the Bristol quad. So Tim Reichard has 634 species from this quad. He, uh, Tim does a lot of moss surveys as well. So he's probably done a bunch of moss surveys in this quad. Um, Bill is right there with 314 and I'm, uh, I'm the lone Eastern shoreman over there at what, 278 species. So our bibliography is really, really awesome. Um, and I think it, it gets neglected. Uh, if you're interested in any of the, you know, certain species in the state, we highly recommend that you go to our bibliography. It's going to give you just lists of all types of books and journal articles and stuff of, of anything you can think of. So, uh, and, and whenever we add, uh, data to the database from uh, peer-reviewed journals, we put that uh, journal article in the bibliography. We're really good about that. So there's just thousands and thousands of articles on here. And uh, most of the time they're uh, um, categorized by, by you know, group species groups like butterflies or beetles or insects. Here we see algae. So if you're interested in certain things, uh, you might want to take a look. You might find uh, find something that you uh, didn't, didn't know existed. So if you wanted to add uh, data to MBP, the easiest way to do it is through iNaturalist. iNaturalist is arguably, maybe besides eBird, one of the most successful international community science platforms out there. Uh, Bill and I fought it for a long time until we finally decided to in, in, embrace it. And we're really glad we did. Our, our life has become much easier now um, that we uh, are using iNaturalist as our, as our main way to ingest data into the data, MVP database. Um, when you, uh, so it's a free iNaturalist is free, um, basically allows you to take pictures with your phone or with a camera and uh, upload data to the platform, giving, um, uh, allowing you to put in the location and notes and everything like that. So um, the way iNaturalist works, and one of the reasons that Bill and I hesitated for so long before embracing it is if two people agree on a determination of a species, it automatically makes it research grade. Well, two people making a determination doesn't make something right. Um, and often a lot of the research grade labels are garbage. 
So we were like, well, how can we break away from the from their research grade material and kind of formulate our own way of vetting the data on iNaturalist? And Bill worked worked amazingly, it came up with just an amazing way to do this. Um, the way that we do it is we have a list of experts, right? So uh, I consider Bill an expert on birds in Maryland. Um, if Bill agrees or makes the determination on a species, then that species automatically gets sent to MBP for consideration into the database. So we have a list. I, I don't know how many uh, experts we have. It's probably somewhere between 50 and 60 people. If they make a determination on a species page, that record in iNaturalist will automatically get sent to a queue in the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Okay. So Bill agreed that Daniel Taylor's prothonotary warbler was correct. He agreed. So now this record is going to go to MBP. Um, when a record gets sent to the Maryland Biodiversity Project, at the bottom uh, right-hand side of the page, it will say Maryland Biodiversity Project is featured on this. It, this photo is featured on the Maryland Biodiversity Project. So you, that's an easy way for you to see whether you're, a record is in MVP or not. So I'm gonna give you a brief rundown of how, of how the records work and how they get into the database, okay? You guys can't see this. This is the inner workings of how things are done. Um, so uh, basically what you're viewing here is when I sign on to MVP is what you'll see. So up here it says at the time there was 354 photos to approve. If I clicked on that, it would take me to a page where I could see all of the iNaturalist records that one that we think should be uploaded to MVP. And then it goes through another round of approval. So to get a record into MVP, it takes two approvals, right? To get it into the MVP database. So what you see here is, okay, this is obviously a prothonotary warbler. I can approve it right here. If I approve it there, the photo will go onto the species page. If I approve it here, approve but hide, it will go into the database, but the photo won't go on the species page, right? Does that make sense? Um, so this is what the database looks like, okay? So if I clicked on Daniel Taylor, I agreed that that prothon was a prothonotary warbler. It should be in MVP. It goes here into the database, and I can actually click on that record and oops, sorry, each record has its own individual number and we can gather all different types of, of data from that record that you guys can't see, right? We can't give out exact locations for obvious reasons, right? Um, say somebody found nesting Swainson's warblers um, and we got photos and we're able to upload it to MVP. We wouldn't want the whole world to know um, you know, because tape playing and all, you know, bad stuff, or, or let's just say long-eared owl uh, roosting areas, right? You don't want to put out all the owl data. You don't want to put out orchid data because of poachers. It's unfortunate, but that's the way it goes. But if there was somebody working at DNR who needed information on prothonotary warblers, we could send them, I, I'm not sure, you know, hundreds of prothonotary warbler uh, records with accurate data uh, for all those species. So uh, underneath that, uh, so let's talk about what we, uh, other stuff other than the website. Um, we lead free field trips almost every month. There's something always going on for the public. And these trips are uh, advertised uh, and announced on the MVP socials, Facebook and Instagram. 
Um, but if you don't uh, subscribe to either one of those, you can go to our MVP blog. So you can click MVP blog, field trips and events, and you can get a uh, list of all of our field trips, right? Um, and you can also see uh, uh, field trip uh, uh, write-ups of, of previous field trips as well. So this is a cool place. Um, I'm actually gonna I'm I'm gonna lead a field trip uh, in uh, the end of April to Rocky Gap State Park in Green Ridge for spring wildflowers. Um, keep your eye. We hardly never say no to anybody, so please sign up. They're totally free. Um, so you can check here or on the MVP socials. Uh, on the MVP blog, you can also see special projects. You can click on Turkey Point. Um, this is, uh, Bill and I are super proud of, um, Maryland hosts two morning flight counts in the fall, one at Dan's Rock and one at Turkey Point. Uh, other than, there's only a handful of other places in the entire country that do these daily morning flight counts. So from August 1st through November 30th, at Turkey Point in Dan's Rock, we go out every day and collect flight data for migratory birds. Uh, it's amazing um, what, we, what we see. And if you go to the blog, you can read up accounts of, uh, almost weekly accounts of what's happening at the two counts by our counters. So last year, Jonathan Irons uh, worked our work Turkey Point and Carl Engstrom worked Dan's Rock. Um, I believe that we're one of, we are the only state on the East Coast that has a mountain count and a coastal plain count that happen simultaneously. Um, it's incredible. Uh, you can, uh, you can go to, uh, we, I don't have it on this presentation, but you, we use a, uh, another community science platform called Trek Talon. Um, where you can go and actually see uh, the numbers live um, as uh, daily. Um, so like the um, Jonathan Irons uh, counted one morning in uh, October, this past October, the highest record of uh, red-bellied woodpeckers ever. Uh, I think he had over 600 um, red-bellied woodpeckers fly over in one morning. Um, red-bellied woodpeckers aren't supposed to migrate. So what was happening, right? But they obviously do move. Um, so it's really cool. It's, it's really awesome. Um, there's a ton of, we're collecting a ton of data uh, and um, we're very excited about it. Uh, here's a Dan's Rock, Carl's write up for the first half of November at Dan's Rock. And all these are available if you wanna go and peruse uh, on the MVP blog. <clears throat> So underneath the MVP blog uh, on the on the uh, on the homepage, you can see actually our MVP uh, Facebook and Instagram posts. If you're not into Facebook and Instagram, this is where you can actually go to see uh, the posts. So if you click on it, uh, this is this is what I posted on Facebook for the MVP post on Sunday. It was all about red stem stork spill. Um, so you can actually you don't have to go to Facebook or Instagram if you don't want to, to read our daily posts. So why do we do this? Uh, you know, Bill and I, um, it's a labor of love. Uh, we both have full-time jobs. We, uh, we both have families that we, you know, are very uh, attached to, um, but we, take a lot of time to make sure that we do as best we can with the MVP uh, project, the Maryland Biodiversity Project. Um, this is a photo of bronze copper. Uh, this bug used to be, this butterfly used to be very common in Maryland. And maybe 10 years ago, uh, the populations just fell, fell away. All of a sudden, nobody was seeing bronze coppers. Where did they go? Um, we were able to give DNR over, uh, uh, over 40 locations for bronze copper. They didn't have any locations because 
they don't keep track of common stuff. So what happens when the common species become rare, right? Think about that. You know, we, we are keeping track of common species that may become rare. Who has data on that other, you know, nobody really other than us. Um, so we, we feel like it's really important job that we're doing here. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a labor of love, but we really feel it's an important task and we're, we're up for it. Um, and that's it. Finally, I want to show you my most favorite photo on the whole MBP uh, website. I think this photo is just utterly amazing. You can see the photographer's shadow in, 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 her, uh, in, in the eyes. It's, it's glorious. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, if anybody has questions, I, Marsha, I don't know how you guys handle that. Uh, um, at this point, Jim, if you'd like to stop screen share, um, yeah. we'll return to the gallery view where we can see everybody and I'll invite people to turn off on their microphones and just speak any questions they have. But I'll start things off by um, voicing a question that Rich, Rick Borchelt put in the chat. Um, he said, can you say a few words? It's two things. Can you say a few words about how the MBP handles sensitive species data and also whether it's possible to submit an observation that is not supported by a photograph? And if so, how you do that? Yeah, um, so uh, obviously we, we are really, we try to be as careful as possible with uh, RTE species, rare, threatened and endangered species. You can't see any data beyond or more granular than quad level for any species on, on MVP. We just decided when, when Bill and I started, we had uh, pretty deep discussions with the Natural Heritage Program. Um, how granular can we go without getting in trouble, right? Without making you guys angry. And they were like, quad level data is good. Now, they have a list of vulnerable species, which are they're what the, what the Natural Heritage Program deems as the most in peril species, right? And we don't give any quad data for the, von, for the vulnerable species. And if a species is vulnerable, we have that tag on the species page. Um, so you can you can actually click that tag and get a list of all the vulnerable species. And you can only see those vulnerable species to county level. Can I can I supplement that, Jim? Sure. Please. Uh, so in iNaturalist, there are fields, and, and Rick might have been uh, including this at that question. Uh, you can obscure or make private any observation in iNaturalist, and we have a system where as that data comes to MVP, I see that uh, it's obscured and I will periodically throughout the week as part of the final review ping people and ask them to share coordinates with us. And with that method, we do archive sensitive species location. So. Uh, one really cool example is there was an interstate uh, box turtle conservation initiative, and we contacted um, Scott Smith and others from the Heritage Program and said, would you like us to support this? And they said, yes, we would. Actually, we couldn't support because Mara only had the quad data and they wanted the more precise mapped data. And we had about 1,500 precisely mapped box turtle uh, observations. That's the most common automatically obscured species in Maryland and iNaturalist. Um, yeah, and we so had, again, about 1,500 records of that that we shared with a very strict data sharing agreement that was also reviewed by Maryland DNR. So we can ingest it. Uh, we take great care with it, and we only share for valid conservation and science reasons like that. Um, but it is powerful. Another one like the bronze copper example that Jim gave where 
you need to have this data uh, to do these sorts of analyses. And then um, for observations not supported by photographs, we don't encourage that, but uh, anyone who has a, a list of data, you can just contact us for some known experts like Sam Drogi's personal B database will ingest that. But in general, we don't advertise, you know, uh, if, if you're someone who has a data set that stands up to scrutiny. If we had Dick Smith's database, we would happily ingest the whole thing. Obviously, Rick, if you had data uh, you want to share in Excel, uh, we've gotten some of the Howard County data from uh, Joe and Tom, Bob Solom, for example. Tom, Tom Stock, we have Tom Stock's butterfly data um, set. So we, we, do, we do ingest large data sets without photos, but it, it's pretty rare that we do that. And, and it's also good to have it like it just doesn't stand up to as much scrutiny, right? So it's good right. for all of us to be able to defend this stuff. We see it all the time. Uh, there was a discussion, uh, you know, the Herp Atlas muddied the water with Cope's gray tree frog and regular gray tree frog. And we just had a case where, yeah, there were more versicolor gray tree frogs on the eastern shore. We were saying, you know, but not the lower eastern shore, Nate uh, and others were noting that. But MVP said, well, we have Dorchester and Somerset. Well, we went back in and it was Smithsonian data from 1905 to 1950. And we said, ah, it's just coded wrong. Right. It's just gray tree frog. It was a taxonomic thing, right? right? So we went in and marked as like um, excluded. So we still keep the data, but to the best of our knowledge, there are no versicolor on the lower shore. Um, and that's a good case of like, we couldn't stand up to the scrutiny later because there was no photo, right? There's a specimen, but what are you gonna do with a hundred year old dead hyla? <laughs> Frog, yeah. Any uh, other questions? Does that answer your question, Rick? He, he indicated yes. Jim, Jim, I have a, I guess, somewhat similar question. Does MVP attempt to ingest any data from eBird? No. Well, uh, kind of. Bill, <laughs> Bill's data and my data. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'll take that. We can, yeah. um, we get enough. We have all the county records and we have some people like Joe Hanfman, uh, Tim Carney, Matt Hafner, that help us ensure we're always up to date with county level data. Um, there's just so much raw data in eBird and with the way we encode it, um, we just haven't taken the time to pull in all that raw data. We have- It's a, uh, that's a lot of data, data Marcia. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, it's a lot. Um, and, you know, you think about it though. So we try to be as, discerning as possible, right? What do you think the error is for Cooper's hawk and Sharpshin oh. hawk and eBird? Oh. Right? Oh, absolutely. You, you know what I'm saying? So it, 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 it gets really tricky because so it's just like, uh, you know, a lot of people think when we tell them that uh, we're ingesting data for my naturalist, they're like, oh, good grief, that pile of garbage. <laughs> And we're like, no, 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 we don't care about anything other than what our list of experts agree and to. And a bunch right? of other quality rules as well with yeah. so, radius and captive cultivated and so right. on. I, 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 you know, my opinion, I'm sure Bill feels the same way. I would rather have less data that's really good mm -hmm. than a bunch of data that's garbage. Well, and, right? and, and I don't I just want to supplement, you know, we know it's there and it's not going away. What we do, you know, iNaturalist, one of the questions we get a lot is, why don't we just put all the data in iNaturalist? And a key detail there is they don't want to be the one database to rule them all. Uh, they asked me to stop ingesting my personal data from eBird in places because they didn't want it to hurt their query time, right? So they Bill, want Bill, Bill actually caused iNaturalist to break 
<laughs> by importing his eBird data, which uh, I think is one of the coolest things. That's, ever. <laughs> that's how I met Kenichi. He's great. He's like, what are you doing? Stop it. Uh, <laughs> so when we see databases like, say, Bob Ringler's data or Lance Bichelle's data, uh, we worked with them extensively and captured most of their data and it meant a lot to them they were very involved that data we were at risk of losing for ebird data we know it's there the people who need it have it if we wanted it we right. can get it so it's not that we you know are actively excluding it we just haven't prioritized it over uh, other sets that just haven't been perused the same way and you see how heavily we link to the data and right. you know all of our so count data goes into ebird and stuff as well I think that one of, in 50 years, when MVP is 61 years old, <laughs> um, I think one of the most valuable things that people are gonna say is these guys kept personal, you know, they they saved Bob Ringler's data. Yep. They, they saved, you know, uh, Lance Bichelle's data. And we want to get more of that out um, to people that that have these large data sets. Um, you know, we can, even if they don't want to share it publicly, let's have a place where we can actually house it for posterity's sake. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think that's really important. Well, the, the way I look at... Um... MVP versus iNaturalist, because you do not take everything out of iNaturalist, I prefer to go to MVP to look things up than to go to iNaturalist. Sure, sure. A absolutely. And, and you know, I, I, natural, I, I shouldn't say everything is garbage in iNaturalist because it's not. It, it's, it's an incredible uh, platform, um, but we're just a little bit better curated mm -hmm. and like and like bill pointed out we do have different missions right uh, i i naturalist mm -hmm. is almost a social way to connect people which is what mbp was missing um you know at one point we had over we used Flickr as our main way to ingest photos and at one point when it was just bill and i doing it we had eighteen thousand photos yeah. backed up waiting to get into the MVP database and most of those were of things that Bill and I couldn't identify so you know what do we do with this guy's millipede right, right. it might be right I have no idea and now that guy can put his photo of a millipede on iNaturalist and we can tag the millipede expert and bam we're done you know uh, and uh, it's and it I think kept us, it kept us up at night for many years. <laughs> many years. One, one distinction with the INAT stuff, uh, to both of your points, is uh, I think that is how they see themselves, a social place to come together and work on these IDs. And I think their model is just about perfect. I've even made peace with research grade. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second if anyone's interested. Uh, I finally get it. Uh, but, you know, you could create a project in INAT and have the same stat, you know, um, strict process as we do for adding things, right? But we do want to archive all of this valuable data for perpetuity. And the other thing is, we need places like this in each state, in each region, in each region to work with the data and have that engagement with science, education, outreach, conservation efforts. INAT doesn't inherently do inherently do that. Right. So having a place where you pull out your subset, rally around it as a place, and then do things with it is key, right? Yeah. I you you can't do that with INAT. What that bill statement there is perfect. Mm -hmm. It's why we're doing this, honestly. I mean, you know, we we uh, uh, that well said, Bill. I couldn't have done it better. That that's Thanks. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the research grade question, uh, real quick, because that we talk about all the time. It the best way to think of it is just a generic data flag, right? So imagine you put in a monarch, somebody agrees, and then agrees again, and it just keeps serving up that monarch photo 
forever, right? Like 200 people have hit agree and you have to scroll, you know, three pages down for all the agrees. It was just a, a practical way to say, this is how we're going to manage the feed when you go to INAT. It's like, okay, this has met some minimum quality level. Let's take that out of the main feed. Right. And then, you know, someone like Rick or Tom or somebody goes through and catches the couple of viceroys that sneaked in with the monarchs. But uh, overall, the quality is surprising. It's like Wikipedia. It's like, this can't possibly work. But go find a misidentified. Go find a viceroy and monarch that's more than six hours old in INAT and tell me when you got it. People are on that stuff, you know, right. curating it. Right. Tom Stock, I saw you typed uh, a question. I, I didn't catch it. I, um, if Tom doesn't want to say it, I have it up to read. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, Tom, do you want to speak or? I'll, I'll just say, he, he posted both a comment and a question, and I'll do the comment first because it pertains to what has just been discussed. He says, we appear to have lost Dick Smith's butterfly records, which is a terrible shame. Agreed. And for Agreed. those who don't know, Dick Smith was Mr. Marilyn Butterfly. He passed mm -hmm. away a few years ago quite suddenly before he could make any arrangement for someone to take his records. So if anybody wants to say a few words about that. Um, it, it is one of the greatest losses, I think, for Maryland conservation and uh, butterfly resources. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it was very devastating. Um, I don't know what happened, uh, but um, hopefully one day um, that database will be available and uh, um, there, the, uh, there's a lot of single record, you know, a species with only one record, you know, and we don't know what we can't support those records without his database is right. bas basically what it is. And that, that's, you know, we, um, I struggle sometimes with like, you know, Mitchell Sater, which is a very rare butterfly overall, not just for Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, we know that it was found somewhere in Northern Anne Arundel County near Tipton Field, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we don't have a date. We don't know who saw it. We don't know any of that. So can we really, should it be on the state list? I, I don't know. We have it on the state list because it was on Dick Smith's list, right? So, but we can't, we can't support it other than saying, well, Dick Smith said it was, you know, is that good enough? That doesn't stand up to scientific rigor, however much we support Dick Smith, right? right. So there, there's, there's some pretty complicated issues of since we've lost that data set. Um, I, I'm sure Tom has a lot more he could add to that but you know it it's 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 a it's it's a shame it's a shame uh, mm -hmm. and and hopefully down the road uh we can uh, some amends will be made and we can you know maybe maybe yeah have, have a lot of that some data surfaces yeah yeah um tom did you want to turn on your mic and say your other question sure can you hear me yeah yes any thinking jim I think I've asked you this before, probably, but anything about franchise, quote unquote, the MVP system in other states. Uh, you know, since I've moved to Delaware, one of the resources I miss for this state is something akin to MVP, because there's stay, nothing over here. So I will say, stay tuned. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Cool. Cliffhanger. <laughs> you know, one thing I will say is whatever happens with that, any data in iNaturalist will easily be ingested for things that happen. Well, you you've blazed the trail. Yeah. Well, so there, there's, you know, I do think we were the first ones to embrace this type of data set. Um, North Carolina has a really good, yep. uh, good, uh, um, website. I, I 
don't like their name choice, but that's beyond, you know, we, I've, I've gotten over that, like Bill's gotten over the research grade. Uh, I've, I've gotten over the North Carolina Biodiversity Project. Um, but, you know, they, they do things a little different than us. Um, uh, and it, it's really well done. Um, uh, I, I think that the What's Maryland it? and North Carolina are really the, the, uh, the two most successful ones that are going to last. Um, and, and we're not quite the same. North Carolina is not like us. We, we do things differently, but it, it's kind of along the same lines. But, you know, I, th I think there's definitely uh, room ahead for expansion. Yeah, and, and we're actively talking to NatureServe and some other states heritage programs about just how to help as right. much as possible. What lessons learned we have that um, might benefit other areas. So yeah, like Jim said, stay tuned. I'm feeling <laughs> more optimistic than I have in a while that there's a, a way forward. Yeah, agreed. Good news. Agreed. Yeah, good news. very good. You look good, Tom. Thank you. I haven't good seen good. you in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Because <laughs> he's in Delaware. <laughs> I know. It's, yeah, what can I say? <laughs> Life at the beach, you know? <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions or comments for Jim or Bill? Yeah. yeah. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, all of the uh, bird data you have uh, makes me think of the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, do, do you uh, share back and forth? Sure. Uh, uh, the data yeah. you have? Yeah, Gabriel and and is in contact with both Bill and I. Um, I, I he's 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 a great guy. He's doing a wonderful job with the Atlas. Um, we're very lucky to have him. Um, we have shared data um, with with them. Um, uh, e Ebert Ebert does a pretty good job, right? Uh, we 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 supplement when needed. Uh, yeah, and I, I think we've talked about this from the early days of eBird with Marshall Iliff being a, a Marylander. Our birder adoption of eBird is near total. So uh, almost anything we have is an eBird. All our bird count data goes in eBird. We're, we're passionate eBird users. Um, so, you know, the the fact that we're not ingesting more actively from eBird is mostly just like they got this. We're you know <laughs> they're crushing it. Yeah, we 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 want to um, for birds and MVP. We want to continue to flesh out those status and relationship and description fields and get our uh, quad maps. You know as as uh, fleshed out as possible. But other than that, we're, we're, you know, you know, make sure we make sure we keep the counties correct and get our, you know, get the information on the species pages. But, you know, that, that's, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to do much more than what eBird does, <laughs> you know. Well, but, I, you know, I guess a good point, though, um, Jim, is, you know, there's eBird and MVP places where you can go view bird data. But one thing we're moving more into is that targeted data collection. Like, all right, so we have the tools. Now, what other data would benefit the state, right? And uh, those migration counts are a good way to get a feel of like overall uh, populations and what they're doing on the East Coast, effect of climate change and so on. Uh, so just like, the breeding bird atlas and breeding bird survey it's a christmas bird counts another way to like have your your finger on the pulse right and birds are such a good um you know barometer of <laughs> such a good Every, uh, everything way to yeah. uh, get a feel for ecosystem health like uh, you don't need to prove that the mass of aerial insects in the atmosphere has gone down by one ton per kilometer since 1960. If you could show that every aerial insectivore is declining, and here's the raw data, right? Yeah. Like you, yeah. it's there. So, 
you know, I to to compliment what Bill said, I agree 100%. You know, the the data that we collect from the Dan's Rock morning flight count and the Turkey Point morning flight count is just adds to, you know, the the importance of that data, you know. So we we can we can put that data, put it against eBird, put it against iNaturalist and it just becomes a stronger platform. Well, you guys are doing an amazing job. I mean, every time I look at the website, it, it just stuns me all over again. It's it's so Thank spectacular. You. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Well, if not, I'm going to hit the stop recording.